This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. Hi, from Philadelphia to Erie and from Scranton to Pittsburgh, it's Behind the Headlines. I'm Charlie Greenwald, Senior Fellow of the Susquehanna Valley Center of Public Policy, and I'm on location uh, this week uh, with our president, Susquehanna Valley Center's president, and uh, one of the great uh, trucking legends, actually, of America, Mr. Ed Arnold, with another edition of the Arnold Report. Here he will tackle your questions that you have sent in to us. And again, on the screen, you will see uh, on our Chiron uh, the email that you should send these uh, questions to. Uh, we have a new uh, roster of questions for you for this weekend. Uh, welcome to the show. Good to see you, Charlie. Good, Good to, to see, you. see you, too. Well, let's uh, get right started here. Oh, by the way, uh, we found out that John Fetterman almost died when he had that uh, stroke at uh, Lancaster General uh, the other week. So, and now apparently um, Mr. McCormick has bowed out uh, and conceded the election primary election to Dr. Oz. Um, lots of things happening in Pennsylvania politics, Ed. Surely is, yes. So, well, let's take a look at our first, our first question, and it couldn't be more timely uh, with what's going on today. Uh, what will the economic consequences of the Russian-Ukrainian war be if it continues through this year? How will this affect small investors across the state and in the nation like me? And what actions do you recommend that I take? What can you tell me? First of all, I want to make a statement that the Ukrainian war could very well become just like the Afghan war. It's going to go on forever. Russia cannot be defeated. Ukraine, at this point, we're saying fight on, fight on. We don't want to negotiate. So therefore, this is going to be an endless war to support our, our military industrial complex and give our government more power. Uh, as far as you personally, this is not good for the country. We are definitely in a period of inflation, uh, basically caused by extensive government spending. And overall, I would recommend, ex maybe for the few exceptions, get out of the stock market. Probably metal stocks like uranium, oil, uh, and possibly other commodities that maybe an ETF in commodities might be appropriate. That, but basically, the, generally speaking, the, the market is under tremendous pressure because we have extensive inflation, and it's not going away because our government has declared war on oil, which is absolutely ridiculous, and it, oil is the basis of the inflation. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Uh, secondly, um, this has uh, uh, created a little bit of a stir uh, through the media and through the public uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, avian flu has broken out among America's chicken, turkey, and duck farms, along with over 20 agricultural processing plants, so it's been said, burning or breaking down so far this year, when in a normal year only two or three ceased production. Do you think this is the result of Chinese dirty tricks in our economy, or is this simply bad luck for American farmers and consumers? How high will our grocery bills go uh, this year at the store? Uh, I, I want to basically talk about primarily the plants that have the, first of all, the news media and some what I consider very reliable news media has chosen not to do their homework. Uh, the, I checked on these plants as far as the number of them that have burned down, mm -hmm. these airplanes causing fires, and actually it's, it's exaggerated. Number one, yes, there were two airplanes that crashed near. The one of them crashed on a, on a field near the plant. Near it was a part of the property, but it didn't affect the plant at all. Uh -huh. The other one hit the chimney of the plant and it killed the plane. The, the pilot died, but the plant did not lose any production at all. So those two airplane crashes, which were extremely unusual, but they didn't cause any problem. And they don't seem to be the result of Chinese dirty tricks. No, well, the point is they didn't cause a problem. Mm -hmm. So now when you get to the rest of it, there was one man who tends to be exaggerous, which was picked up by the news media, and basically said that uh, 
uh, all these plants. Well, according to, he only listed nine plants. Two of them are the airplanes. So only seven. And if you were to go to your, the internet, you would find, and then they give you a reference to the local sheriff's department or the local news and so on, you'd find that these were pretty well all minor plants, except for one that did burn down completely and may not be rebuilt. But these companies, every one of them said, this is not going to affect their production particularly because they have a multitude of plants and they can switch it to others. For some reason, like one was a small potato chip plant, another was another potato, it seems to be thinking with potatoes. That, but they were small, <laughs> inconsequential plants, so they did not affect it. As far as the thing on the, yes, there were a lot of chickens killed. First of all, if you take the number of total chickens, it was, again, not a giant number. It will, it did affect the prices, but at the same time, chickens do multiply very rapidly, so therefore it will be in a reasonably short period of time going back to normal. And uh, it, again, it was exaggerated that yes, do we occasionally have something where we kill a bunch of animals? It's happened before. So therefore, again, uh, to say there's a giant conspiracy here, I think, it, very frankly, it is uh, uh, almost, you could say, fake news. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, next we have a um, viewer who has said, I have just spent over $100 to fill my gasoline tank today. These high gas bills are eating up our family's budget. When will they stop going, on, going up? What can we do to convince the federal government uh, to let American companies drill for oil again while other energy sources are being developed? Uh, there is no question our government has created this crisis. Uh, I have no idea. We know we have a brain-dead president, but therefore who is behind it and making these decisions? I have an opinion, but I'd rather not talk about that. But there is definitely a par group which is deciding on the policies of America, and they have decided we're going to get rid of oil. And even though we're not nearly ready, whether 20, 30, 50 years from now we will be in a society of electric is questionable but we definitely can't flip the switch. Uh, first of all, I did read an article about this converting to electric. We're gonna need 25% more electricity generated. Mm -hmm. Well, since we also wanna close down our coal power plants, and we're obviously become more and more anti-nuclear, which between them, they, could, they are 40% of our present power, we'd have to build a massive number of power plants, and their solution is we should have wind and solar. Wind and solar are kind of, compiled for a very small percentage of our present electricity, and all of a sudden, you would talk about I have to increase it by an astronomical amount, you would probably wipe out every bird in the country with the, so with the wind, and even with the, the solar, winds. which is basically manufactured by China mm. because it's very dirty and not recyclable. So and then we have the whole movement to tear down dams and uh, around the country and then the hydroelectric power as well. Ironically, I just I was recently touring the state of Washington and Oregon and in the Olympia Park, they did tear a dam down that was generating power, but it's been there for whatever, 40 years or more. So basically, there has continually thumping because again, I, there is 40% of the state of Oregon's energy comes from, from dams the Columbia River, the Snake River, and so on. Mm -hmm. There's 50-some dams, amazingly. But every one of them, where it's relevant, has a fish ladder. So, that this, so therefore, basically, this has not affected the salmon. What is interesting, though, because again, I just came back, is that despite the fact that we have major hatcheries for the salmon, they're not coming back. We're putting millions of salmon into the ocean, but only less than one-tenth of one percent is coming back and the salmon are depleting, they don't know why, because they're being lost in the ocean. Very possibly the Chinese and the Russians and the Japanese are fishing them. I don't know. And the seals are eating better than ever. Apparently. Well, but the seals can be eating millions of salmon. Yeah. So, all right. Well, the next question that we have um, is, uh, what is an index bond? How do index bonds work, and are they good investment tools right now, Mr. Arnold? Well, I think you'd have to say, are bonds a good investment right now, period? And the answer is, I know the portfolios are supposed to be balanced, but we know interest rates are going up, 
and therefore bond values are going down because they go in inversion to the, to the rate of the interest. Uh, so overall, there are X number of index funds, whether you go to any of the big guys like Vanguard or, or uh, Fidelity and so on, uh, it's, if you want to invest in bonds, I can't say it's not a bad way to invest, but basically the, uh, my opinion is if you want to have a fixed income portfolio, buy short-term treasuries. It's a lot less expensive and there's, there's a lot less risk. Okay, thank you. The next question uh, is from a viewer that says, I believe that I need to build a precious metal holding for my investment portfolio. Uh, what do you think is the best way to do so? Should I buy and hold the actual metal? Should I buy the metal and let some investment firm hold it for me? Should I buy stocks in the gold and silver industry? Or should I buy coins and uh, coins, gold coins, antique and new? I would basically recommend of those groups you listed is to basically to buy coins. First of all, there's they're, no question they're negotiable. So therefore, in the time of, of, of let's say, currency uh, crisis, coins are recognized. But specifically, uh, that small denomination coins, preferably silver coins, which would be junk silver, which unfortunately is a little difficult to buy because you normally got to buy in a bag of it, and that's a fair amount of money. But uh, maybe you can find some where they break them down. That, uh, but overall, if you can keep them in your own safety deposit box, the closer the better. If not, you can find somewhere that you can have them stored that's reliable. Mm -hmm. Okay, we want to take a break right now, and we'll be back right after this. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Pennsylvania State Association of Township Supervisors, the largest, most influential municipal association in the Commonwealth. Since 1921, PSATS has been preserving and strengthening township government and securing greater visibility and involvement for townships in the state and federal political arenas. Covering 95% of Pennsylvania's land mass, townships represent 5.5 million residents, more than any other type of political subdivision in Pennsylvania. Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. By the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Visit pahighwayinfo.org. Welcome back to Behind the Headlines. On this segment, uh, Mr. Arnold and I will be uh, continuing to uh, look through the questions which you have sent us uh, for him to uh, offer his advice and expertise to all of you. Well, Ed, the next question we have, uh, again, very much uh, reflecting the, the current news. Uh, how long can Elon Musk pause his takeover of Twitter? After he takes it over, how high do you think Twitter stock will go? Uh, has Elon Musk replaced Warren Buffett as the wisest leader for global investment? First of all, uh, Elon Musk is not an investment advisor. He's an entrepreneur that creates value by doing things, mm -hmm. uh, not just manipulating money. Uh, but overall, the Twitter thing, number one, the price is set. The maximum you can get for it is 54.20 a share. That's period. It will not be a public company. It will be owned by Elon Musk. If it, assuming his uh, statements are correct, that they have grossly exaggerated the number of clients, so they have a lot of fake accounts, it's very possible that his offer will drop and they would still have to accept it because they've given him false information. So instead of being worth, let's say, at $54 a stock, you may only get maybe $40. I don't know how far down it could go. Uh, that it's, it's around 30 right now. So the market is saying they, they're not sure the deal is going to go through, which is very unusual as this kind of spread, but more so is what will the actual price be? So overall, that Elon Musk, as far as Twitter, it, it will not be a public company. So therefore, no matter how high it can go, it will not, you cannot own it. Well, it's interesting that the first uh, look uh, is uh, indicating that up to 50% of all the accounts on Twitter were 
uh, bots. They were essentially uh, fake uh, accounts. So I don't know. I guess that will have some. I guess I would say, how reliable is that news? I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah, we I don't. understand we'll have to wait. within the next couple of weeks the report will be coming out. That will be public. But basically, right now, it's all speculation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, another uh, item that has been in the news recently is why did Spirit Airlines, which I have stock in, not me, but the, the viewer, uh, why did Spirit I uh, Airlines, which I have stock in, spurn JetBlue's attempt to take it over? Uh, with the price of airline fuel increasing rapidly, what is the long-term outlook, what is the long-term outlook for uh, airlines across Europe and the United States? Well, first of all, uh, and again, I am not an expert on spirit. I have no, not followed. I just looked up the information that's available. Right now, and these are facts. Uh, the offer that is, first of all, JetBlue has now made a hostile takeover. They are going directly to the shareholders and said, this is our offer. It's 33 and some change of share. Uh, that if enough shareholders obviously submit their shares, JetBlue will take over. The, to me, and right now, what the, uh, and the stock, by the way, of Spirit is only around $20. So what you're talking about, an improvement from 20 to 33, I would vote to sell to JetBlue just by the fact that's a tremendous amount of money. Jet, what Spirit wants to do is they want to merge with Frontier. There's a lot of risk in mergers. Yes, it would make them a very large and I suppose more efficient airline, but the fact remains that mergers don't always work out and the, the savings that don't always materialize. Also, there's a possibility the government will not approve the merger since there has been a tremendous consolidation of uh, airlines and this would make their, their merged company the fifth largest airline in the country. So therefore, there, to me, there's a lot of risk that the, for whatever the reason, the board, in their own self-interest, they like to be independent, uh, don't want to sell to JetBlue. Uh, that, so at this point, it, it appears to be, first of all, number one, the government may not allow JetBlue to buy even Spirit. We don't know that. So there is there to be all sorts of regulatory approvals, but the best course would seem to me to accept the offer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what, what, by the way, what, what do you, how do you feel with airline mergers? Uh, does that decrease the number of um, options that passengers have for extra routes to uh, smaller and mid, mid-sized cities? Well, even big cities. Philadelphia, mm -hmm. I'm going to say 75% of the flights, domestic flights out of Philly, are American Airlines. Uh, Charlotte is obviously even higher percentage, but most of your major airports, Newark is basically United. Mm -hmm. I mean, more and more because of the only handful of major airlines, there are very few cities that really have extensive multiple choices. Yes, there are other airlines flying in and out of Philly, but not n particularly frequently. So mm -hmm. really, we have already, in my opinion, had too many mergers and too much concentration, where most cities are pretty much dominated by one airline. Okay, thank you. Um, the next viewer is saying that uh, uh, they saw recent reports that penny stocks were increasing in value right now. Is this a good time to invest in penny stocks? And if so, what area of the economy do you recommend to, to look at penny stock investment opportunities? First of all, I must just say I would never be particularly recommending penny stocks, period. But in times like this where people are moving more to quality, which means larger companies, I think penny stocks would be a very ill-advised investment. Okay. Uh, and we've talked about penny stocks sometime in the past, and your uh, opinion remains consistent on that issue. Yes. Okay. The next viewer is uh, uh, written and said that uh, we, hear, uh, we hear little news about our electric grid. Yet I remember hearing reports in the past that our grid is old and needs to be replaced. Is this still true? What are our electric companies doing to deal with this potentially lethal weakness in our economy? What do you think needs to be done now? Let's put it this way. It's very difficult uh, to get the nitty gritty facts. We have, I believe it's four or five grids, major grids that interlock in this country. 
Uh, but there's no question that everything you've read in the past, our grid is not in good shape. If we're going to, as we have talked earlier, increase the demand by 25% or more, I think we have a very big problem. I think a lot of the uh, brownouts and blackouts in California are being caused by there's more and more concentration of electric cars. Our grid will not, contrary to what a lot of experts, and I've read the X number of articles, and they say, no problem, no problem. I don't agree. I think they, they're living in a, a rose-colored world. Our grid is not in good shape. And first of all, it's also extremely subject to, to attack by, like we had, which you, most of you wouldn't remember, but there was a blackout in New York City when, the, when there was a tripping of, of our, uh, let's say the fuse box, and New York City went out. And it was out for a couple of days. That was only one little area. If we were to have a few key sabotage points, we could blacken this country. So overall, I think our grid is very susceptible to problems, and I don't think it's in very good shape. But very frankly, I actually don't know. Well, the grid is, the grid is old, isn't it? It's very, very old. It goes back to the 20s. It's been patched and, and basically band-aids. It has not been redone. Okay. All right. Uh, next, we turn our sights to, uh, you said you're on the West Coast. We turn our sights to a company who's been on the West Coast and uh, uh, elsewhere. Uh, what is happening with Boeing? Shouldn't they be one of the world's stellar companies? I do not understand why they moved their corporate offices from Seattle to Chicago and now to Washington, D.C. Are the corporate executives looking for better schools for their children? Why have they made these questionable moves? How could they fail so badly uh, on the MAX 737 plane? Ironically, while I was in Washington, I did tour the Boeing plant. Oh. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see the plant because oh. they are still locked down when COVID, so they had to film and they gave information. Ah. The, so, but overall, there are 50,000 employees in Seattle. They are, first of all, Boeing has multiple plants throughout the country. Right now, the 787, I just found out from asked a question when I was there, is being produced in South Carolina. A lot of their military stuff is in St. Louis and so on. Because of over the years buying people and so on, they have multiple plants. Their biggest plant is still Seattle. And overall, this corporate headquarters was a very, very small number. The president, I think, and his staff, really a direct staff. So it's not many people. The company is still obviously in Seattle. Oh, so what we heard on the news was perhaps a bit exaggerated. exaggerated. The You're of... only talking about maybe 20 people moved or some small number as far as I know. At least that was to Chicago. I'm not aware of the new the DC move. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, the next one, uh, again, re <laughs> reverberating in the news of the day. Why in the world do Canada and Mexico have lots of baby formula on grocery store shelves. Yet America has to airlift baby formula into our country from Germany, and the first lady greets pallets of formula at the airport. Uh, obviously, again, we have mentioned this earlier, our bureaucrats have shown their unbelievable incompetence. Number one, American for efficiency has created more and more concentration. A large plant maybe can produce, I guess can produce, a little bit better than a bunch of smaller plants. And we have concentrated that this particular plant that they shut down, according to the news, is between 20 and 25 percent of our total baby food production in America. An, an Abbott plant in the Abbott Michigan. Plant, yes. So therefore, obviously, it was susceptible in that sense that we had such tremendous concentration and we have such a very large population. So obviously in these other countries, I have no idea what their production is, but we are definitely concentrated. And by closing this one plant, it created a major, major crisis. And it was created by our government. Uh, from what, again, you read, uh, this was not a major problem. It was sanitation and so on. Nobody has died. Nobody's even reported getting sick. So why they would shut this plant down and create this crisis, uh, again, uh, brain-dead government. Hmm. And Canada didn't have this problem. 
Well, Mexico no, because it, again, it was only an American plant, and they supplied America. I assume. I assume mm -hmm. Canada has their own plant. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that. Yes, they seem to be uh, cleaner, I guess, or well, this issues. one particular plant. There are other other plants. We have half a dozen plants, I guess. This one particular one was, which is surprising because that lab we would think is a good company, but anyway. Well, in the last two minutes of the program, uh, Ed. Can you tell us uh, what you feel, how you feel about the, the 4% rule? There's been a, a, f a rule in uh, retirement planning for many years that says one should not spend more than 4% of your principal in any one year. And if you regulate things that way, you'll have enough to make it through retirement. How do you feel about that? Uh, first of all, I think the 4% rule never did make a lot of sense because it totally depends upon your situation. Number one, what do you want to do in retirement? Uh, as a simple rule, the 4% rule says that if you retire with a million dollars, you should spend $40,000 a year. That would assume that there'd be a normal appreciation of your other assets that are still being invested. The market would do its normal thing. Also, it assumed that inflation would be, again, relatively modest. Those are, that also, but the thing is, do you have any debt? Do you want to do a lot more? Do you want to help your children while you're in retirement? Whatever. Your individual circumstances are so varied. So therefore, the biggest thing you should do when you retire is set up a budget and look what your income. What that says is if things are normal, which is no such thing as normal, uh, <laughs> that uh, therefore your, your money would last to your normal retirement. Again, normal retirement. Well, if you live to be 102, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. So therefore, and that is the other thing, of course, has become more a challenge in retirement. People are living, good news, longer and longer. So therefore, when you say I retire with a million dollars and I expect to die in the next, let's say if you retire at 65, maybe 15, 20 years, well, now you live 30 years, that could be a problem. We all know it was not designed, Social Security, to maintain you. It was a supplement. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if a person runs out of their basic income or they had a fixed pension, if you are with a government which has unlimited printing, you have pensions that have cost of living adjusted, as is so-called Social Security, assuming you can trust cost of living. That, uh, however, if you have a fixed number and you outlive it, you will still not have it. So. Basically, it is a nice sounding rule, but there are just so many variables that you've got to look at your individual. And there, I would agree that you got to talk to some financial advisor, possibly. Okay. All right. Well, we want to thank you very much, Ed, for being with us for another edition of the Arnold Report. And for all of you viewers, we encourage you to keep on sending uh, your questions to Mr. Arnold. And uh, we will tackle them and be back with you again uh, in a week or two. So we'll see you next time on the Arnold Report and on Behind the Headlines. See you then.